On today's Locked on Jayhawks, Grady Dick turning pro. KU women's basketball team wins the WNIT. And KU football makes a power move, bringing on Sean Snyder. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You can hear me as well. Rock Chalk Sports Talk Monday through Friday from 3 to 6 p.m. on KLWN in Lawrence and the best of RCST podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Locked on Jayhawks and making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get any of your podcasts. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube. On today's show, we got a lot of uh, KU wrap up news stuff to get to from over the weekend slash Friday. Um, we're going to get to Grady Dick turning pro, which is we're going to lead things off with. Sean Snyder, the son of Bill Snyder, is now uh, an assistant coach for the KU football team. And the KU women's basketball team wins the women's NIT against Columbia um, to claim that title. This episode of Locked on Jayhawks, we're going to start off with the uh, Grady Dick news, though. So Grady Dick decides to go pro. That news... Um, came on what Friday uh, that he is going to declare now he didn't officially when you read the statement say whether he's going to be retaining his collegiate eligibility or not but I guess the point is that he didn't say that and it probably doesn't matter Uh, basically the point is that he's going to go pro like it's it's pretty much a done deal the only thing that maybe could I don't know I mean if he enters in and he signs with an agent then it doesn't matter either way But I guess hypothetically, if you were to enter in and, you know, like you don't wish for this to happen, like you hope everybody's okay. But you remember this happened with Brandon Rush. I think he tore his ACL during the pre-draft workouts, ended up having to come back another year for KU and then came back and obviously won the title and ended up being a first round pick. You hope that doesn't have to happen for for Grady Dick, but I would assume that, yeah, he's going to be gone. It's official. Um, So as far as the legacy, I guess that he leaves, it's hard to say legacy for a one year player. But clearly a a fan favorite, a guy who was really fun to watch in his one year at KU, he will consistently be put on those short lists of who are the best, uh, the best freshmen uh, in Bill Self's time at at KU, who are the best one and dones in KU history, right? He'll he'll be on that list. Uh, I don't know if he'll be at the top. There's some good names that are on that list, right? You have. Josh Jackson to Andrew Wiggins to Joel Embiid, uh, Xavier Henry. It uh, depends how you look at Ben McElmore with the red shirt season. Uh, there were some other really good one and done players in KU's time, but he's certainly on that short list of those top players with what he was able to do, shooting over 40% from three as a freshman. KU needed him to come in because it wasn't a great shooting team around him. The players around Grady Dick shot 32% from three this year. They needed him to kind of carry their water with the three-point shooting and a lot of times you saw in the games that KU struggled were the games that he wasn't able to get free from three or he wasn't able to launch up a bunch of shots and because of that KU the rest of the team wasn't as good of a three-point shooting team and it really hurt them but the fact that he was able to carry that weight as a young freshman usually a lot of times the shooting is what takes a little bit longer to come around as a freshman but that's obviously his calling card and He was really impressive in his one year at KU. I think the idea when he first came to school was maybe this would be a two-year thing for him. Obviously, things changed. He ended up being a a second-team All-Big 12 pick by that notion, top-10 player in the Big 12 as just a freshman. Uh, We talked about last week the decision. Most of the mock drafts or big boards have him kind of between that like number 9 to number 11 range in the draft. He'll be making a lot of money, and uh, certainly you wish him well, and it'll be cool to see his progression in the pros because – I think there's a lot more to his game than just being a three-point shooter, and I think you'll see that added by, you know, you're going to look at his game in four or five years and be like, man, he's he's such a complete scorer uh, that I think he'll be able to add to that over the course of his time in the NBA. Uh, as far as where the you, obviously, you know, did so it's not one of those things where you went into this decision going, oh, no. This blindsided us. How are we going to like you've been planning for this happening and having to get over this for a little bit of time now. Right. And so already and and we've talked about this, like my immediate uh, worry, I guess, for this next year's KU men's basketball team is that is the shooting going to be good enough? Right. Are Are they going to have enough shooting? Because if you have Dewan Harris 
KJ Adams at the four, Ernest Duda at the five. Unless KJ like balloons into being a big three point shooter, which I, I think that would be a little bit unexpected. It, it's tough to see how that works shooting wise. Now, uh, you go back to the team two years ago that won the title. You saw Dewan Harris at point guard as your starter. Okay. Dewan Harris is your point guard and your starter. Um, your power forward was Jalen Wilson, which Jalen this past year shot 33, 34% from three. But Jalen Wilson in the championship season was shooting like 26, 27% from three. And then your center, David McCormick, was a non three point shooter. You were able to be a good enough three point shooting team because you had two guys who could come off the bench and hit threes. Uh, Jalen Coleman lands, and at the end of the season, Remy Martin, and your two other starters were snipers. Now, with Christian Brown, he didn't – it, 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 it was funny. Over the course of his KU career, people were like, no, shoot more, Christian. Shoot more threes because you're such a good three-point shooter. Uh, but Ochai was obviously, like, shooting a ton, high volume at super high efficiency. So basically basically what that means for KU is that if that is going to be your starting lineup this year, Dewan Harris with Ernest Dude, KJ Adams, those two and three men better be snipers from the outside. There's some targets they're going after, like the Nick Timberlake kid from, from uh, I think, Towson. He would be a perfect fit for that to come in and help you with that. But that's what you're going to be searching for. You need shooters. because Right now, there's real questions about the shooting on next year's team. There's also questions about who are going to play the wing minutes for this team. Now, if KJ does move to the four, you could be playing him 10, 15, 20 minutes per game at the four. El Marco Jackson might be giving you 20, 25 minutes per game as a, a guard next to Dewan Harris, which means that you have him at the two, and now there's less minutes that you have to give out at the wing with the three part of the two position, part of the four position. So there's less minutes than you might think with Kevin, Jalen, and Grady going pro. I guess we are kind of waiting on the decision of both Kevin and Jalen. Jalen, obviously, that's like, 100% chance that, that he's going to go pro. With Kevin, maybe there is a little bit of leeway there. Maybe there is a little bit of room of, I don't know, could he come back? I'm not expecting it, but I don't know. Maybe there is a, you know, I said 10% for Grady Dick. Maybe it's 15%. Maybe it's, I don't know, even less than that, 5%. I don't know, for Kevin McCuller. Um, So you're kind of just trying to figure out with the transfer portal now, get enough shooting and get wings specifically wings that can shoot. Those are the two things that I think you're really going after at this point in time because of the departure. Again, not unexpected, but certainly if you were clinging to any hope that Grady Dick would come back and this team would all of a sudden be, you know, they, they would have that shooting checked off because you would have one of the best shooters in the country. That is no longer the case. Now you clearly have work to do from here on, but again, not unexpected work from where KU has been. All right, in just a second, we're going to get on to the news of KU football, making the hire of Sean Snyder with Locked on Jayhawks. But first, this episode of Locked on Jayhawks is brought to you by Built Bar. The Built March Madness bracket is here, and we know you have a favorite bar or puff. Now's your time to make it count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. Uh, you can vote on whichever one is your favorite. You can vote on just, I don't know, which one you think is the best Cinderella story. Do whatever you'd like, but you're going to want to do it because when you vote for your favorite bar or puff, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky locked on listeners will get a free box of built free box. As long as you vote and you win that possible, um, you know, random drawing. Not only that, but one locked on fan is going to get a 12 month subscription to Built to have Built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. Sounds pretty cool, right? You got to try Built, Built the best protein bar ever. Seriously, they're so amazing. You won't think they're good for you, but what makes them so good, for starters, they're high in protein, they're low in sugar, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. Run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now. Now, to for your favorite bar or puff, pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March, so hop in and support your pick with Built Bar. Sean Snyder is a new assistant coach for the KU football team. Now, Lance Leipold, Sean Snyder met with the media on Saturday, and Leipold basically said like they, they tried to bring him on last year, but he ended up going to Illinois. Um, so they bring him on this point, and at this point in time, like most of the staff, most are hey this is your job like we don't really have anything open so the official title there is just like assistant to the head coach um which i think is more of like it's you know in the office it's like assistant to the regional manager i don't think it's like that in terms of the title meaning nothing but i think it's a little bit like that in terms of just like hey we don't really have a, a job open for you right now but we know that you were helpful we know that we can bring you like 
just come on. We'll create a title for you. And then if special teams coordinator opens up or, or whatever in a year or, or something like that, then we'll fit you into that role. It's just right now we're in the middle of spring ball. All our coaching positions are filled. Here's the title we're going to give you for this point in time, but you're still going to have a big role in what you do for this team. And as far as what that role is, well, first of all, uh, Sean Snyder, and clearly this goes back to the Bill Snyder days because he is the, the son of Bill Snyder, which adds a lot of intrigue here. Um, was always known for great special teams at Kansas State. And to be clear, Kansas State still had a really good special teams unit last year. This is not just specific to Snyder coach teams. Kansas State just continues to have great special teams. But clearly, Sean Snyder knows how to work special teams units. Had really good ones at Kansas State when he was the special teams coordinator. Goes to USC, I think that was in 2020, and they had one of the best, if not the best, special teams units in the country. Then he goes to Illinois last year. They had kind of a middle of the pack. I think by one metric, they were ranked 68th in the country in special teams units. So about average on the season, which, you know, for KU last year, who uh, was not good at it, a jump to average would be a huge increase in what they could be in terms of special teams. And then you look at some of the specialists they've added from the kicking game to the Australian kid they're bringing in over the summer to punt. Um this could be a much improved special teams unit for KU next season. He's going to help with that. Now, he wasn't listed as a special teams coordinator, but when you look at that being his background, it's pretty clear he is going to help out in the special teams verse of things. And there were a lot of KU fans, I think deservedly so, when, when KU struggled so mightily last season with their special teams, pointing the finger to be like, well, why is there not an actual special teams coordinator? Because right now it's uh, two of the assistant coaches for KU. Taiwo Onatolu is one of them who coaches the DNs, and then he splits up special teams duties with other assistant coaches. And so having this one guy who can kind of focus on some of that stuff, even though that's not his official title, is going to help them immensely in that area. Now, one of the things that Lance Leipold said at his presser on Saturday um, with Sean Snyder was that uh, Sean Snyder is also going to help out with some recruiting stuff, which I found that to be very, very interesting and impactful for KU. Obviously, the Bill Snyder name runs thick through the state of Kansas with high schools, with recruits, knowing who he is, what he stands for, and having his son go out there to be able to establish in-state connections and further Kansas trying to recruit in the state of Kansas I mean that that is gigantic that is gigantic to whether it's just getting him in a building to you know be like hey I'm Sean Snyder like will you meet with me about this kid or you know to recruit I'm Sean Snyder I'm the son of Bill Snyder like I've coached now at both schools in the state of Kansas can I meet with your, your kid like those things are very very impactful and for Kansas I think this staff has done a, a much better job than previous staffs at trying hard to establish connections in the state of Kansas. And I know there were there were some things last offseason about like that, oh, well, there were some flaws with this or that within state or that, you know, you had this big recruiting class in state for the 2023 class and Kansas didn't have any commits until they got the flips from Calvin Komet, uh, Clements and Jane and Ham. Um, and that, yeah, they're still like, falling behind in that area but it's like they're fighting an uphill battle kansas has been so bad at football for such a long time all the kids growing up watched kansas state be really good for a long period of time and kansas be bad they're fighting that uphill battle but they've done a good job of trying getting out to all these schools and doing their best um and this just adds to that this shows a commitment to that in-state recruiting which i think is very very important for ku so you love the hire i think from from that standpoint like uh, forget the notion of just the the funny aspect of this of of being bill snyder's son coming over to kansas just from areas of weakness for ku special teams and trying to improve in-state recruiting which i wouldn't call that a weakness but it's clearly something you're trying to make inroads on and haven't been as good as like a kansas state this is a perfect hire for that notion and uh, you, you heard the comment from sean snyder saying that you know he wanted to be with people who are all in the right direction and coaching staffs like that and i think that's what this is that there is a respect level from the Snyder family because, you know, Sean Snyder is his own man. He can, it's not like Bill Snyder is going to be like, you know, oh, you're grounded. You can't coach Kansas, right? Like he, he's a 50 year old man, right? He can do what he wants. Um, but I, I would imagine like, you know, you have those conversations with your dad who is such a legend at, at K-State. The stadium is named after him to where, you know, you're like, is this going to make things awkward for you at all? 
And is this the wrong move for me? Is this the right move for me? Right? Like I talked to my parents when you're talking about like job stuff. And um, I, I think that there is a level of respect with Bill Snyder and Sean Snyder and that family, clearly with like Lance Leipold than what the staff is now trying to do at KU. I think for the longest time, there have been a lot of coaches at KU who just didn't get it. Lance Leipold is a worker. He is a grinder. He's not about the flash. He's not about the, you know, here or there. He is about doing the work and putting together a good program the right way. And I think there are some similarities in terms of how they went about it between those guys, that there is a level of respect there, which makes this higher. So it'll just be kind of funny to figure out, like, will Bill Snyder show up wearing KU gear? Will Bill Snyder uh, tweet out about, like, good job for KU and the special teams or whatever it is, like he's done with some of the past teams for Sean Snyder? How awkward are the Thanksgiving dinners going to be? It's just it's going to be very funny um, kind of from that standpoint, which just adds another layer to this. Um, that is great. I think for the, the, the rivalry between the two schools that I think is great for just the sport and in the big 12, like it's another storyline. I think it's fun. It's funny. It's adds to KU just trying to be a better football team. So there's a lot of, uh, different notions as part of it that, uh, I thought were very, very interesting there. All right. We're going to finish up this episode of locked on Jayhawks talking about the KU women's basketball team. The KU women's basketball team is women's NIT champions. They take down Columbia 66 to 59. Good Columbia team. They came in at 28 and 5 on the season. They had the lead 16 to 15 after the first quarter, but uh, KU really dominated inside 24 to 10 in points in the paint, led 10 to 2 in fast break points when they were able to get out in the open floor. And the defense, as it was really for the entire WNIT, was stellar. You held Columbia uh, down in, in shooting the ball. They were just 30.9% from the field. They shot just 9 of 34 from 3. KU didn't have a great offensive game for really the second straight game. Like Washington in the previous game had a good defense, and you know KU only had 30 or 61 points. This game, KU only shot 33% from the floor, 33% from 3. They grinded out. They got to the free throw line. They hit, they hit their free throws. Uh, Tayana Jackson, a beast again, 17 points, 21 rebounds, and three blocks inside. You got 12 more from Yvette Mayberry, um, 19 from Zakiah Franklin, and Holly, Holly Kerskeeter gets to go out with a win on her home floor. You had almost 12,000 people in attendance to the game. That was really cool to see. Hopefully that carries over to next season where you start seeing some really good attendance numbers for KU because if they do, I mean, you're talking from just a recruiting standpoint. The KU women's team uses like all the same facilities. Uh, basically, they're they're playing an Allen Fieldhouse, all this stuff that the men's team uses, and the men's team typically gets all these good recruits and stuff. And there is a bit of history there with with the KU men's team having more history, but it's not like the KU women's team hasn't had good history with Lynette Woodard and uh, some of the things that they've done in the past, winning all these Big Twelve titles and stuff in like the nineties. That if you start getting that type of crowd attendance for Allen Fieldhouse, maybe KU women's team can start landing more of these. I know they have Samaya Nichols coming on as a five-star recruit. Maybe they can land more of these five-star recruits, these top 10, top 15 recruits. And that would be a very big deal because you see the women's final four going on and what Caitlin Clark is doing and undefeated South Carolina. And now they're playing LSU. And wouldn't it be cool for KU to get to that level? And there, there's no reason they couldn't if they get the right crowd attendance and support from the donors and the fan base and everything. And what's cool about this women's NIT, it gives an opportunity for teams that have players coming back. I mean, it is cool, too, for the seniors to get to play extra games like Holly Kerskeeter. But there are a lot of players for KU that can come back next year. They'll be missing Holly Kerskeeter. But guess what? Zakai Franklin can use her COVID year. Diana Jackson can use her uh, COVID year and have one extra season. Um, Wyvet Mayberry can be back next year. Chandler Prater will be a senior next year. There are a lot of key players for KU that should and could be back next season. That These extra games, these extra practices – could be really beneficial. Uh, we were talking with Brandon Schneider on, on Rock Chalk Sports Talk last week, and he mentioned that Arizona, just a few years ago, won the NIT. Very next year, they were playing for the national title game. If you have the right growth and commitment from your players and you make the right additions in the offseason, you can make that big leap next season. I mean, look at the men's game, too. The NIT finalists from last season, it was Xavier beating Texas A&M. All of a sudden, A&M jumped to being a top 25 team that was a seven seed that a lot of people thought were underseeded. Xavier went from being the NIT winners to being a three seed in the NCAA tournament and making the Sweet 16. You can make a big run off this and use it as a launching pad, and that's what could be cool off of it. That, yeah, it was disappointment for KU not to make the tournament, but if now they make the tournament next year and they're better than ever because of it and they get more long-term experience and extra practices than if they would have lost in, say, the first round, 
this could be a long-term huge win for Brandon Schneider and the program at KU. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. We'll be back uh, tomorrow with an episode with Nick Schwartz. Have a good rest of your day. You can wherever you get any of your podcasts or YouTube. Later.